But tonight, this is my great pleasure to introduce Cherie Mason, who's a very dear, dear friend of mine and a really very famous person in our, in our midst. She's an author, a journalist, a wildlife advocate. Um, and as I said, we're honor, honoring the legacy of the uh, pioneer, Rachel Carson, whose book, Silent Spring, awakened the world to the consequences of pesticides like DDT. And um, Cherie is a former board member of Mary. Um, she, some of you will remember her long-running environmental radio program on WERU, the Environmental Notebook. I was on that several times. And she's also known for having initiated a campaign to sh secure federal funds for the Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge in Wales, Maine. And now I give you Cherie Mason. You. <laughs> uh, should I test it? How, can you hear me? No. no? <clears throat> How about that? Is that a little better? Yes. It's my job to talk. A lot has been written about Rachel Carson. I used as my main uh, resources the several speeches I've given, or lectures or talks, on Miss Carson from Linda Lear's very big biography. And the one I liked the best, though, was Paul Brooks' um, reminiscences of Rachel Carson. He was her editor for years, and so they had a very close relationship, and he knew things about her and had uh, insight into her that was fresh. So I, I very much recommend those two books to you if you haven't already read them. And <clears throat> this last week in the New York Times, there was a review, uh, the title being The Poisoned Earth. How's that? Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a new biography called The Life and Legacy of Rachel Carson on a Farther Shore by William Souder. And it's an excellent re uh, review. I'm gonna, I've ordered it. And uh, you may want to, too. So on this, the anniversary of the publication of one of those rare books that change history, that alter the direction of humankind's thinking, we well may ask, how did Silent Spring come about? Was it possible for Rachel Carson to write a bestseller on a theme as dreary as pesticides? Her admirers had their doubts. Her first love was the sea, which led to some of the most spectacular descriptions of sea life ever put to paper. So after the poetry of the sea around us, the edge of the sea, under the sea wind, and later a sense of wonder, she tackled a tough scientific subject with her usual grace and her superb command of the English language. She would make chlorinated hydrocarbons into a work of literature. <laughs> she changed course because she had to. There would be no peace for me, she declared, if I kept silent. Silent Spring, her last book, would be the product of immense labor and amazing moral courage. It would be a scientific expose of the human health and ecological hazards of DDT and other pesticides. <clears throat> it's important to know where she lived and worked. She first visited Maine in 1946 while working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The unspoiled beauty of the Maine seacoast won her heart. And in 1952, she built a simple little cottage or working studio on an estuary of the Sheepscot River. She drew much inspiration from her many hours at the main shore. It became her home until her death 12 years later, and her ashes were strewn there. 
The roots of her concern about pesticides went back many years. She had become aware of the dangers of DDT while she was working for the Fish and Wildlife Service. This newly discovered miracle poison, so useful in wartime for emergency control of insect pests, began to be produced by the chemical industry on a massive scale. And its disastrous effects were being widely experienced. In the fall of 1957, there was startling wildlife mortality in the wake of the Department of Agriculture's fire ant extermination program on Long Island. Then a friend wrote telling how her property, which she had made into a private bird sanctuary, had been inadvertently sprayed with DDT for mosquitoes. The next day, her yard was covered with dead songbirds. Stories like these made Rachel Carson more determined than ever to sound the alarm in a book. She began to realize that only by writing could she make a difference. It was difficult to give up everything else to concentrate on the grim subject of pesticides. And a year later, she committed for a series in The New Yorker and a book for Houghton Mifflin. In the progress of her exhaustive research, she established a network of scientists, naturalists, journalists, and activists. Friends in government were willing to give her confidential information, even at great risk to their jobs and reputations. She hoped the Reader's Digest would have her do an article for them, but they declined, saying the subject was too gloomy for their readership. So she continued writing the book. It had several working titles, The War Against Nature, even Car Carson Opus Number 4. <laughs> what decided the issue was a quote from John Keats, La Belle Dame Saint Merci, the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. The title would be Silent Spring. During this stressful time, her mother died, which affected her intensely. And then health issues came raining down on her. Ulcers struck, then pneumonia, followed by a sinus infection. She sometimes was so weak, she could hardly get out of bed, but she kept on working. And then the worst. Two cysts were found in her left breast. One was benign, they said, the other required radiation and a radical mastectomy. Her doctor recommended no further treatment. She continued to be in great pain, but was confident that she would recover. It was a testament to her courage and persistence that she continued to work well into the night. Five months later, she discovered that her doctor had lied about the results of the pathology tests. The other tumor was also malignant. Why the physician did not suggest further radiation will never be known. But in the 1950s, it was fairly common to withhold such information from a female patient. If she were married, he would tell her husband. But another explanation can be that he thought the cancer was so advanced that no treatment would have made a difference. Later that year, as she was starting to cope with a round of radiation elsewhere in her body, she contracted a staph infection while being hospitalized for meningitis and phlebitis in both legs that made it impossible for her to stand or walk. Arthritis plagued her all her life. But with her usual good humor, she remarked, such a catalog of illness if one were superstitious, it would be easy to believe in some malevolent influence at work, determined by some means to keep the book from being published. <laughs> but it was published. After being serialized in The New Yorker in 1962, the complete book was published by Houghton Mifflin that same year. And the storm erupted. The attempt then and now to discredit her work as emotional, and unscientific goes to the heart of attacks on Carson as a woman working out of her depth, a writer masquerading as a scientist. She was dismissed as, quote, a spinster who didn't know what she's talking about. Monsanto Chemical Company ridiculed Silent Spring in a parody called The Desolate Year, depicting the horrors of a world without pesticides. 
something Carson had never recommended. As her critics were to learn, her facts were essentially irrefutable. The list of her sources alone, gathered from a wide range of scientific disciplines, runs 55 pages in Silent Spring. When CBS announced that Eric Severoid would talk with, Car with Carson and her critics in April of 1963, two days before the broadcast, three of the five commercial sponsors of the show canceled. Lysol, Standard Brands, and Ralston Purina. The remaining two stuck it out, Kiwi Polish and Brillo Manufacturing. <laughs> She worried that the cards would be stacked against her. She needn't have, as you will see. Dr. White Stevens, in a white lab coat, spoke for her adversaries. We are very grateful to the Rachel Carson Council in Maryland for lending us this segment of that historic hour-long program. Bestsellers printed on September 27, 1962. Up to now, 500,000 copies have been sold, and Silent Spring has been called the most controversial book of the year. By Rachel Carson, who also wrote The Sea Around Us, worked four years in the preparation of Silent Spring. What she wrote started a national quarrel. Chemicals are the sinister and little recognized partners of radiation in changing the very nature of the world the very nature of its life. Since the mid-1940s, over 200 basic chemicals have been created for use in killing insects, weeds, rodents, and other organisms described in the modern vernacular as pests. And they are sold under several thousand different brand names. These sprays, dusts, and aerosols are now applied almost universally to farms, gardens, forests, and homes non-selective chemicals that have the power to kill every insect, the good and the bad, to still the song of birds and the leaping of fish in the streams, to coat the leaves with a deadly film, and to linger on in soil. All this, though the intended target may be only a few weeds or insects. Can anyone believe it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth? without making it unfit for all life. They should not be called insecticides, but biocides. A spokesman for Dr. Robert White Stevens. The major claims in Miss Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, are gross distortions of the actual facts, completely unsupported by scientific experimental evidence and general practical experience in the field. A suggestion that pesticides are in fact biocides destroying all life is obviously absurd in the light of the fact that without selective biological activity, these compounds would be completely useless. The real threat then to the survival of man is not chemical but biological. In the shape of hordes of insects that can delude our forests, sweep over our croplands, ravage our food supply, and leave in their wake a train of destitution and hunger, conveying to an undernourished population the major diseases and scourges of mankind. If man were to faithfully follow the teachings of Miss Carson, we would return to the Dark Ages, and the insects and diseases and vermin would once again inherit the earth. Up to now, we have presented only one side of the pesticide controversy, but there is more to be said. Miss Rachel Carson. We've heard the benefits of pesticides. We've heard um, a great deal about their safety, but very little about the hazards, very little about the failures, the inefficiencies. And yet the public was being asked to accept these chemicals, was being asked to acquiesce in their use and did not have the whole picture. So I set about to remedy the, the balance there. Excerpts of Miss Carson's remedy, Silent Spring, first appeared in the New Yorker magazine on June 16, 1962. 
Then Houghton Mifflin Company published the complete text and Rachel Carson's attack was launched. Chapter 2, The Obligation to Endure. It is not my contention that chemical insecticides must never be used. I do contend that we have put poisonous and biologically potent chemicals indiscriminately into the hands of persons largely or wholly ignorant of their potentials for harm. I contend furthermore that we have allowed these chemicals to be used with little or no advance investigation of their effect on soil, water, wildlife, and man himself. Chapter 6, The Earth's Green Metal. Many herbs, shrubs, and trees of forests and range depend on native insects for their reproduction. Without these plants, many wild animals and range stock would find little food. Now, clean cultivation and the chemical destruction of hedgerows and weeds are eliminating the last sanctuaries of these pollinating insects and breaking the threads that bind life to life. Chapter 7, Needless Havoc. We poison the caddis flies in a stream, and the salmon runs dwindle and die. We poison the gnats in a lake, and the poison travels from link to link of the food chain, and soon the birds of the lake margins become its victims. We spray our elms, and the following springs are silent of robin song, not because we sprayed the robins directly, but because the poison traveled step by step through the now familiar elm leaf earthworm robin cycle. When the public protests, confronted with some obvious evidence of damaging results of pesticide applications, it is fed little tranquilizing pills of half-truth. We urgently need an end to these false assurances, to the sugar coating of unpalatable facts. Chapter 16. The rumblings of an avalanche. Spraying kills off the weaklings. Inevitably, it follows that intensive spraying with powerful chemicals only makes worse the problem it is designed to solve. The list of resistant species now includes all the insect groups of medical importance. Beyond the dreams of the Borgias. So thoroughly has the age of poisons become established that anyone may walk into a store and without questions being asked, buy substances of far greater death-dealing power than the medicinal drug for which he may be required to sign a poison book in the pharmacy next door. In river or lake or reservoir, or for that matter in the glass of water served at your dinner table, are mingled chemicals that no responsible chemist would think of combining in his laboratory. And there are so-called tolerances, which permit small residues of most of these chemicals to occur on food. The human price. Little is said about the hazards of the fad of gardening by poisons or of insecticides used in the home. The sudden illness or death of farmers, spraymen, and others exposed to appreciable quantities of pesticides are tragic and should not occur. But for the population as a whole, we must be more concerned with the delayed effects of absorbing small amounts of the pesticides that invisibly contaminate our world. We have to remember that children born today are exposed to these chemicals from birth, perhaps even before birth. Now what is going to happen to them in adult life as a result of that exposure? We simply don't know because we never before had this kind of experience. Now we know from experiments on animals that many of these chemicals accumulate in body tissues. We know that some are liver poisons, others are nerve poisons. And for still others, we have evidence that they produce mutations and in various other ways are exceedingly dangerous materials. Now, all of these things, even any one of them together, would be ample cause for caution. But I think added together, they mean that unless we do bring these chemicals under better control, we are certainly headed for disaster. Finally, it would seem that the basic arguments between Miss Carson and her critics transcend the specific pesticide issue. 
for they involve a conflict of attitude toward man's role in his environment and his attempts to control and manipulate nature for his own benefit. Dr. White Stevens. The crux, the fulcrum over which the argument chiefly rests is that Ms. Carson maintains that the balance of nature is a major force in the survival of man, whereas the modern chemist, the modern biologist, the modern scientist believes that man is steadily controlling nature, that he has already disrupted the balance of nature by his overburgeoning numbers, his cities and his airports and his roads and the way of his life. Now, uh, to these people, apparently, the, the balance of nature was something that was uh, repealed as soon as man came on the scene. Well, you might just as well assume that you could repeal the, the law of gravity. The balance of nature is built of a series of interrelationships between living things and between living things and their environment. You can't just step in with some brute force and change one thing without changing a good many others. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that we must never interfere, that we must not attempt to tilt that balance of nature in our favor. But when we do make this attempt, we must know what we're doing. We must know the consequences. Man's attitude toward nature is today critically important, simply because we have now acquired a fateful power to alter and to destroy nature. But man is part of nature, and his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. The rains have become an instrument to bring down from the atmosphere the deadly products of atomic explosions. Water, which is probably our most important natural resource, is now used and reused with incredible recklessness. Now, I, I truly believe that we in this generation must come to terms with nature. And I think we're challenged, as mankind has never been challenged before, to prove our maturity and our mastery, not of nature, but of ourselves. Well, <clears throat> most critics were surprised at the size of the campaign mounted against her. They even attacked her marital status. She said, I had no time. <laughs> and of course, there was her gender. She kept cats. She loved birds. Clearly, she had overstepped her place. A year later, at 57, she died. But not before knowing the powerful influence of her message. President John Kennedy, a friend and champion, had his Secretary of the Interior, Morris Udall, establish a new research lab so the Fish and Wildlife Service could expand their research on the effects of pesticides on wildlife. Later, the Federal Pesticide Control Act was passed, requiring the registration of all pesticides. And within the next 10 years, almost all use of DDT was banned. The 5,600-acre Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge was established in Wells, Maine in 1966. In 1980, President Jimmy Carter posthumously awarded Carson the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our government's highest civilian award. But of the many honors she received in her lifetime, there was one, she said, quote, that was the most deeply satisfying thing that has ever happened in the Honors Department. She was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters, along with only three other women. In a letter to a friend the year before she died, she wrote, The beauty of the living world, I was trying to say, Oh, it's the enemy. <laughs> chemical company doing that. <laughs> uh, I'll start. The, the beauty of the living world I was trying to save has always been uppermost in my mind. 
That and anger at the senseless, brutish things that are being done. I have felt bound by a solemn obligation to do what I could. If I didn't at least try, I could never again be happy in nature. But now I can believe that I have at least helped a little. It would be unrealistic to believe that one book could bring a complete change. Wrong, Rachel. Just about everyone agrees that Silent Spring launched the environmental movement. In the past half century, numerous environmental conservation and agricultural developments have been linked to Carson and the consciousness change she generated. She introduced concepts and gave us words that are common today. Words like ecology, food chain, biosphere, even ecosystem. These are some of the effects of her vision. The establishment in 1970 of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, which serves as the regulatory body for the chemical and pesticide industries. Passage of the Clean Air, Clean Water, and Endangered Species Acts. A growing environmental movement that today includes at least 12,000 grassroots groups and some 150 major nationwide organizations. The membership or participation of about 14 million Americans. An increasing emphasis on local food production and organic methods of farming. Development of more preci precise application systems and increased emphasis on integrated pest management to reduce pesticide use and energy consumption while maintaining quality and quantity of food production. While such transformations in science and culture are encouraging, the damage being done by poison chemicals today is far worse than it was when Carson wrote the book. More must be done. And no one takes on Carson's legacy more seriously or more successfully than Dr. Susan Shaw and her Marine Environmental Research Institute. Okay, um, uh, so here we are today, 50 years later, and we are, we are really now in the trenches to save our oceans. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because from the love affair with chemicals that started in the 40s with DDT, um, we now have 84,000 chemicals in, in commerce. We did not realize at the time that they would be with us forever, that they would bioaccumulate, and they, they would be so toxic. Uh, we've learned over the years, DDT and PCBs were banned in the 70s, but um, they're still around, um, very much around. They're recycling in the oceans and in food webs worldwide. And now we have a whole spate of thousands and thousands of new chemicals in everyday products that are not regulated. They are, it turns out the law that was put in place 
to regulate toxic chemicals was incredibly weak, and I'll talk about that. Um, allowing these chemicals to be grandfathered in, there, and new chemicals to come in without testing. And all of these are flowing into the sea. These are the perfluorinated chemicals, the PFCs. They're in everything we use, food wrappers, uh, stain-resistant fabrics, Teflon. Um, they're in no, uh, the nonstick pan, and they're in firefighting pumps, and they certainly have gotten into our drinking water. Some of these have been banned because they are uh, carcinogens. They cause other problems, environmental um, endocrine disruption, liver damage. And then the flame retardant group of chemicals that we've been focusing on are also in everything in our everyday lives, clothing, textiles, foam, furniture, everything that has foam in it, mattresses, couches, chairs, upholstery, TVs, computers, the hard plastics of everything, in electronics, they're in building materials. These chemicals get into house dust as the products break down, and then they get eventually to the environment and get become part of our food web. And they also cause endocrine disruption and their developmental neurotoxins and cause other things. Why do we have all these chemicals in our lives and indeed in our bodies? And as Rachel Carson said, all the children are going to grow up, and those children are us. This is us. We are all filled with these toxic chemicals. We have hundreds of chemicals. If you had your blood tested, as I did, you'd find a hundred or more chemicals in your blood. And that's because of the weakness of the federal regulation, the Toxic Substance Control Act of 76. We've got tens of thousands of chemicals that have been allowed to get into com commerce. The EPA is not able to regulate these chemicals, and they've set it up so that the industry is the only way that safety information is provided, and the industry does not provide full, complete information, as Carson was saying. So 85% have no health data on them, and we also have this thing called Trade Secrets. Bill Moyers did a program about this about 15 years ago on PBS. These chemicals can have fancy names. Then we don't even get to know what the chemicals are. You can't even look them up. So 50 years later, what's going on? The, our oceans are in decline. International scientists have, have said in a big report to the um, uh, United Nations, ocean degradation is happening at a faster rate than ever predicted. We face a global mass extinction of marine species within a single generation. That is, we have less than 10 years to do something about this. So as all these chemicals wind up in our oceans, the oceans are the final sink. There's nowhere for them to go. They're very, very persistent. They last for geologic time. And they continue to recycle through ocean food webs. About eight years ago, I started to notice that the levels of chemicals in marine animals were astronomically high. And I began to be, become alarmed at this rising to toxicity. We started researching what we call sentinel species, which are the harbor seals. They're at the top of the ocean food web. They bioaccumulate chemicals like the PCBs, the DDTs, the new chemicals, the PBDEs, which are polybrominated diphenyl ethers, which are the flame retardants that we all have in our furniture. So these chemicals are clearly reaching the sea big time. They're winding up in the tissues of marine animals and in fish that we all eat. So we are, what's happening is the, we're poisoning the ocean food supply. Um, we've been investigating this for now about 15 years in the Northwest Atlantic from Eastern Canada down to the coastline of New York, New Jersey. And this is research that's been highly impactful for policy and legislation, both in Maine, in the U.S., and internationally. And what we've been finding is the levels of the chemicals in the tissues are so high when they beach upon our when the, the animals strand on our beaches, they're considered hazardous waste. 
These are the, this is a die off of harbor seals from southern Maine, Stratton Island, off the coast of like around um, Portland. And, the, and then recently there was a big die off of dolphins off of Cape Cod. These die offs are not an isolated thing. They're recurring and they're happening more frequently and they're involving more and more animals. We're not talking about 10, 20 animals. We're talking hundreds of animals, thousands sometimes, that beach up all, all together. And we, 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 there's no explanation for it. What we say is, what I say is, having done the work, is that we know the animals are no longer normal. We have poisoned the ocean to an extent that at the top of the food web, they're, they just contain too many chemicals to have normal reproduction, normal survival first year, normal uh, immune systems, normal brains. They're, you know, the animals are not normal. So what we do on the main coast, we respond to these strandings, we report those, we pick up tissue from the animals, we do chemical analysis of the tissue, we report what we find, and we compare that with findings all around the world. And what we have found about the flame retardants that there are very high levels in our harbor seals and in fish. And this is like hake, different kinds of hake, haddock, herring, flounder, American place. These are fish that are commercially important fish. And the fish that we actually sampled were right out, out here in Blue Hill Bay. They're not fish down in, you know, some contaminated area of New Jersey coast. They're right here in, in Blue Hill Bay. But all those fish are migratory, as are the harbor seals. So we published a lot of this information in peer-reviewed journals. And as we're publishing, we are discovering that flame retardants are a problem on every U.S. coastline. This is a NOAA study that was done in 2009 showing that PBDEs, the flame retardants that we've been using mostly in flame, um, in foam furniture and in electronics, are in every coastline in mussels, in the sediment. And then we did a big, I did a big um, review paper with my colleague, Dr. Keenan, in 2009, showing that their levels are rising in every marine species on every shoreline of the American continents. And this goes from shellfish all the way through fish, sharks, up through the birds, the whales, dolphins, harbor seals, on every coast, including the coastlines of Canada, and in people. Long blue line is, there's a doubling of these compounds every two to five years. So uh, this is pretty alarming information. What do we do with the information? If you're a scientist, you usually, you report your information to other scientists. You go back to the laboratory. So we decided it's too alarming. We started reporting this and trying to influence legislation here in Maine in the U.S. and internationally. And this was a st starting in 2007 with the banning of the neurotoxic flame retardant DACA in the Maine legislature. That carried over to the U.S. in 2010, and that was Hannah Pingree and her mother, Sheller, Shelley Pingree. Then Hannah, we worked with Hannah to pass the Kids Safe Product Act. 2008, we've been working in the legislature ever since on the, uh, trying to stop the repeal of the BPA ban this year to maintain the Kids Safe Product Act, which we did successfully. So uh, as a scientific organization, we've moved into action and into policy to try to make a difference. Then this um, year, the Chicago Tribune picked up the story of, about flame retardants and exposed the industry in the shameful legacy that has created the problem we're living with, which is that the in industry's lobbying for these terribly toxic products to keep them in the marketplace as long as possible, no matter what the health and environmental consequences. And the, the series is called Pl Playing With Fire. We have this on our website if you want to read. There are four stories to it. And it goes very deeply 
The work we did as scientists set up these reporters to did, do this story. <clears throat> um, basically, what it shows is that they are using the playbook of the tobacco industry to get these products marketed no matter what. And I, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but what the expose showed is what the scientists had realized is that these adding these toxic flame retardants to all of our household products doesn't make fires uh, safer. It does not save lives during fire events. It makes fires more toxic. This led us to get involved in a new study, of, it's a human biomonitoring study of what uh, firefighters are exposed to when all these products that we're using that are flame retarded go up and start burning. So this was a, a study, this is not the scientific name of it, but it's actually the chemicals and the cancer-causing chemicals in California firefighters. And I just wanted to say, I just did an interview on this with CNN that's coming out, I believe it came out this week. Um, but it, it, what I wanted to say to you is that here, from here in Blue Hill, Maine, we're doing work that's impacting the world. We're, we're doing work that reaches across the whole country. We're doing research that matters. We're doing research that we're willing to go and use in testimony, and I'll, I'll show, talk more about that. We are looking actually at firefighters as a species. Why? They have multiple horrible chemicals during when they're fighting fires. They have high rates of many types of cancer, testicular prostate, bladder cancer, multiple myeloma, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma have been identified. We're also now looking at a rise in breast cancer in the female uh, firefighters. So they are the highest exposure group for humans. They tell us a story of what would happen to us if we were exposed to more of these chemicals than we already are. And believe me, we already have the highest levels in our body of any population on the face of the earth. We have 40 to 100 times higher of these compounds in our blood and in our children than in Europe or in Asia. So our study showed a few things, which was alarming and also extremely, um, you know, important for people to know. It was the first study to measure the brominated dioxins in firefighter blood that are produced when these products go up in smoke. Um, when the, your chair that contains these flame retardants starts to burn, it produces dioxin. Dioxins cause cancer. We found high levels in the firefighter blood, higher than in the U.S. population or any population, and we found very strange patterns of these chemicals that do not look like normal people, meaning that this is from the firefighting exposure. So this helps explain the cancers. The, this study will be replicated by the CDC on a large scale. It's in peer review right now. It's coming out soon. Find whether or not the firefighters were wearing respirator protective gear did not actually matter. They all had this similar pattern in these high levels that's very, very disturbing. These are the guys that are saving the rest of us. So, you know, I wanted to show one thing from the science side is that these are the weird patterns of the um, flame retardants alone. And you see the uh, orange, at the orange bars at the top there. And um, this, is, this is the DECA. This is the neurotoxic flame retardant, BDE-209 DECA. You know what you find in normal people? You find no DECA. DECA does not accumulate in normal people through food exposure. It accumulates during fire events in the smoke. So this is a firefighter signature pattern. And uh, this is exposure to cancer-causing chemicals and neurotoxic chemicals. And it's just a wonder that firefighters, you know, the, the age of firefighters ranges from the 20s to the maybe the mid-50s. There was one guy in our study that was 59, and 
it's a very dangerous occupation, but they're also taking it for the rest of us, meaning that we've got to do something about these chemicals in our lives. So this study, the preliminary findings I released to the U.S. Senate hearing in late July, and this is Bob, Barbara Boxer's <clears throat> committee, the Environment, Environment and Public Works Committee, and they were taking up the... Um, the looking at passing the Safe Chemicals Act, which is Lautenberg's Act, and I'll show you that. And this guy, Tony Stefani, gave testimony showing the findings we had come up with. And he is the, he's on, one of the co-authors on the paper. He's the founder of the California Firefighter Cancer Prevention uh, Foundation. So that, this is Senator Lautenberg. From, who's a sponsor of the Safe Chemicals Act. It's the first act that is now reforming the old antiquated Toxic Substance Control Act, which is so out of date and so not protecting us. And the committee actually, after testimony, approved this act. It still needs to go now to the full Senate and the full House. And it needs a Republican co-sponsor to go forward. <laughs> yeah, so any, no, if any of you know um, anyone who might help us with this, please, please prevail upon them. It's so important. This is the first step. It's such a good step. It, it, it denotes progress. And, and Lautenberg said, for, for too long, the chemical industry has deceived the public and the government about the safety of their products. Today, we are saying game over. It's time to protect public health. Does that sound like Rachel Carson to you? It sounds like Rachel Carson to me. Uh, so now, after 50 years, I want to take us back to pesticides and, and take this back to you. What, is, what, do you. what do you know about pesticides? And let's just, for example, say what's on your lawn. We all have lawn, we are on the coast. We have lawn care that whatever we do is flowing into the ocean. So, um, you know, of all these chemicals in, con uh, in commerce, many of which are toxic, um, a lot of them are the pesticides that are used on lawns and gardens. 82% of all U U.S. households are using up to three to four different kinds of pesticide products. Most of these are herbicides that are applied to lawns. We use over 90 million pounds a year of these things. And this is more per acre than is used in agriculture. We have identified eight pesticide products of high concern. Most of us only know these products by their trade names, which are like um, a weed and feed and um, turf builder and, and Roundup. Roundup. So you can see here, there's 240. The chemical information I know, but you don't know. You can't find this on the product. You have to, so what we're doing, we're posting, see all these trade names, how wonderful they sound? Anderson's Golf Products, right? Um, Doctel Flowable, Agway Complete Fruit Tree Spray. I love this, um, and I don't love this. It's, it's, so, it's so concerning how crazy the industry has gone with these products in the absence of any kind of meaningful regulation or protection from our government. So we have to look these things up. We have to see how many of them are causing cancer. And I, I'll tell you, of the 30 top, top products of concern, many of them are possible or probable carcinogens. 13 linked with birth defects, 21 with reproductive effects, 15 with neurotoxicity, 26 with liver and kidney damage, um, endocrine disruption, and almost all of them are allergic sensitizers, which means it crashes your immune system as you knew it. Um, and here we have more wonderful names, departure, herbicide, you know, um, there was a real big one here, um, ultra, Weed master, weed beater, warrior, warrior, I love that. 
okay. <laughs> anyway, the, the tragedy is that children pick these, th these compounds up. They're, when we track them into the house, they, they, they come off the lawns, they go everywhere, and children have the highest levels in their blood. These are our children. Um, so here's what we see, on, if you even read the label, which you should. So this, this information does not come from the EPA. This information is only what the manufacturer of the product is giving us. So they're allowed to do this, just like they're allowed to call it a fancy name and not tell you the real chemical. Um, and so you have here, we have hazard to human and, uh, human and domestic animals. They don't tell you that this is deadly to bees. This is acutely toxic to fish, acutely toxic to seafood, acutely toxic to domestic animals and wildlife. Um, what's in Roundup, I just want to make a little point on that one because I do know glyphosate when considered alone in a test, glyphosate is moderately toxic, um, so it passes um, muster. It's, uh, it's banned by many European countries, but Roundup ca uh, contains many other ingredients. They're called inert chemicals, so some of those are surfactants. And this is the story of the, the, so, something, something like the chemical dispersant story the correct sense to me. When you combine those chemicals, glyphosate and surfactants, glyphosate and what they call inert chemicals, they do not identify. But I look them up. I know this is, this is a highly toxic mixture. And the point of this is, one of the things in, in culture, there's a study that shows it kills human placental cells in culture. What does this do to our children? The point is for us to know this is the most high volume use chemical by all our lawn care people, all the golf course people, and it's going into drinking water, it's going into our oceans big time. And so what we can, I want to activate a little bit here. What can you do? One thing is ask the golf course people what they're using, what they're actually putting on that golf course to make it look so, so great. And buy safe lawn care products. Look into this. Read the labels. And we have in the back there examples of these safe products um, on the table. And um, you can look them up also on our website. It's, there's many ways to take care of your lawn without killing things like your children. Um, I, this is something we can all do, but it requires some dedication and some sacrifice. It requires understanding more about how do we do this organically? How do we do the, the green thing? And taking that extra step. Um, more information is available. Mainscape has those products. There's a pesticide free zone that talks more about it. We have now we're having more about this on the Mary website. We also have information about what's in your couch. How do you get a non-toxic couch that your child sits on? How do you get a non-toxic mattress? Where do you buy these products? Um, you know, how do you get electronics that are not uh, laced with f flame retardants? This is part of what we're doing with the STOP campaign. We're launching a, a campaign now. I've mentioned this just briefly, and it's stop toxic ocean pollution. The oceans are the end game for us. We must take care of our oceans because our oceans are so linked with human health. Um, we have our priority concerns are the toxic chemicals like flame retardants that we're using now. They're flowing into our seas and they're flowing into the tissues of fish and animals. Plastics, microplastics are getting into the food web as well. We have the problem of the chemicals used in oil spills and shipping pollution. There are answers to all these chemicals. There are things we can all do. There are products that don't, that need to be replaced. They're safe alternatives. So our initiatives are to broadly raise consumer awareness, citizen awareness, collaborate 
on advocacy and green design innovation, conduct the research that's going to tell us where to go next, what we need to do, what's actually going on out there in the world that we live in and are part of, um, and engage in policy reform and legislative action. So we need you. We have got to have you active partners in this. Please get involved with us. I'll, we, you'll be hearing more about the campaign coming up in the, in the days and weeks coming up. But one thing we all need to do is get that Safe Chemicals Act out of that committee. Find a Republican, please. Um, contribute to our toxics research here that's going all over the world, putting Maine on the map, become an informed consumer through our website, other websites. Tell us about those. Reduce your plastics use. We have ways you can do that. And start to read labels and buy safe alternative products. This requires a learning curve. All of us are part of this very environmentally conscious community, and I know we're all going to engage in this, but we need to do a little bit more now as we move forward because we don't have a whole lot of time. So get involved. We so invite you, and I want to end with Rachel Carson, who was so a part of the Maine Coast, loved this place, did her best work here, was so in inspired. She was, as you saw, riding Silent Spring here. And it's appropriate, I think, on the anniversary of the, 50 the 50th of Silent Spring to launch the STOP campaign and start to now focus on oceans. Ocean health is human health. So we invite you, and I appreciate your time and your patience hearing me tonight, your interest. And what we'd like to do is have some questions for Cherie or myself and, and, have, and hear from you. So thank you.